Oh yeah, my name's Timothy Ship. I'm with UNU Wider. And my question is for Kunal and also I'd like I'd like to ask the same question to Hema's work in uh, in relation to Hema's work. So, it's about this concept the of the motherhood penalty and that's really popular uh, popularly known as a contributor to the gender pay gap. But I'm wondering how this this idea that increased child care responsibility for women influences the productivity gap that you you've seen in India, and if you if in that paper if that was examined or looked at, and then furthermore, how the transmission mechanism of this from the gender pay gap to the gender wealth gap in property ownership might how that might have an impact. Thank you. My name is Paula Herrera. I'm a professor at Universidad Javeriana. Thank you very much for this session. It was really interesting, all the papers that you presented. So I, I have one question for Kunal. Uh, it's related to the, the questions they were raised before, but how much of the labor productivity that you're measuring is uh, being affected by the fact that maybe women are having more home-based production in informality activities and men are having their activities, although they are informal, they are maybe being doing in factory or in the street. I don't know how, how it works, but maybe the place where these activities are taking place uh, can affect this labor productivity. So I was wondering if you had this uh, data in mind or if you did something related. And I have a question for Julia, which is, I know you said that profits increased by a lot. It's like, it was amazing, but I was wondering how much does that mean in terms of minimum wage or in terms of the spending of a household? Because as far as I know, for instance, in, in Bogota, you can have an informal or an entrepreneur uh, who is making some profit, but if they are too small, then these large increases might not mean too much and could also explain the fact that the nutrition facts for the children are not improving. But also other expenses, as you were saying, they. They use their profits in, uh, in investing. Again, I, I was a bit uh, lost in that. I don't know if it's in their own business or in other business. But again, how much of that will be related on, on actually the absolute value of what you are uh, finding, not in percentage terms? And um, for Emma, I was wondering, uh, you, you had this entrepreneurish, uh, entrepreneur, uh, well, line of, of, of your regression, but what were you hoping to get with that? What was the mechanisms between land ownership and being an entrepreneur in terms of the, I guess, of the, uh, at the urban, at the rural level, I could see it a bit more, but at the urban, what were you trying to do? It, it was more financial uh, access. I don't know. I, that was my question. I'm for Adriana. I don't have too much questions because the data is really rich, and I hope we can take a look at it. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. Hello, I, I am Mariana Violias from Sedlas. I wanted to ask Adriana um, if, with this service, it is possible, like, to construct the intra-household story. For instance, you, you know if a woman answers the survey, she tells you that she lost the job, she increased the, the time allocated to childcare. Can you, for instance, separate the, um, these uh, patterns depending on whether the husband lost the job as well, like to see what happens within the household? I don't know if that lost the job as well. So. Uh, like to know what happened within the household, but I don't know if you have the information considering only one person answers the, the, the survey. Hi, uh, I'm Estefania from Universidad de la Republica. Um, I want to ask also Adriana uh, if uh, because you show data for like for uh, aggregate uh, of uh, Latin America, many uh, information, and uh, I think that 
if you look like at different groups, like heterogeneities across different groups, they may tell you like different stories. Because uh, for Argentina and, Bras and Uruguay, the informality in fact uh, decreases. So uh, because there was like a change in the composition of employment, so that the informal ones are the ones who are losing their jobs. So the formality increases. So maybe you can do like more heterogeneous analysis by different countries, and it will be nice if you could like relate this with the policies that were implemented in each country, like uh, those countries that were where the formality was higher, they also uh, do a lot of uh, policies like related to formal labor market, like uh, unemployment insurance and this kind of things. So I think that this uh, analysis will be interesting to incorporate. It's kind of related, but... Okay, thank you. I am Martina Carejeta from Uruguay. I have also two questions for Adriana. Uh, it was a really nice presentation and the data seems like amazing to, to start working with. Uh, you show us there is huge heterogeneity by country in this um, variable of uh, job losses, uh, the gender gap in job losses uh, among countries. And I wonder whether are you analyzing like some correlation considering the stringency of the COVID lockdown restrictions in the country and how that affected uh, the, the job losses for female and men. And also related with Stefania's question, if you are analyzing the correlation of these measures by country, uh, considering the policies that are uh, m that were more effective in mitigate, mitigating this uh, increase in, in the gender gaps. And also, I have some curiosity regarding the, the time use uh, data you show us, uh, that, that you like show us that not only females but also fathers increase the time dedicated to caring activities and I wonder whether you are already analyzed the, the second round of the second phase survey and, and show if this change in the in the time use it's like persistent over time and or it only responded to the like more hard like time of lockdown and then that effect like banished it over time. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I think. Uh, start from the same again. Sure. They first. Yeah. 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 Okay. Like, no, no, no. You are invited. No, no, no. 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 <laughs> okay. Then Hema should start. Okay. All right. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you all for the questions. I think there was one from Tim that was uh, common to both. Uh, me and Kunal. We so didn't in this particular paper. We didn't really look at. Uh, motherhood penalty. There are legislations that you can look at that say whether you have uh, mandated maternity leave or and if you have uh, mandated paternity leave. Uh, and certainly that would affect women's ability to participate um, in the labor market. We have another paper that's looking at motherhood sort of penalty and how that is. Uh, so I, and I think uh, definitely that is one that can cause uh, a labor market impact and at a long at a longer period and there's very good evidence uh, that has come out recently that's looking at tax records, etc. Um, and I'll just quickly also answer the second question before turning it over in, in terms of entrepreneurship. So what this entrepreneurship variable is, it's a, I think it was in a summary model, it's actually picking up four uh, different aspects of the law in terms of whether a woman can open a bank account in the same way as a man can, if she can get access to credit the same way a man can, if she can sign contracts like a man can and something else. Uh, there was a fourth variable. So it was a summary of all four. Uh, and we used entrepreneurship only in the summary variable, really trying to see if there was, it like uh, to ensure that we weren't omitting out certain significant characteristics. In some ways, you can think of it as uh, her ability to be self-employed because women are more likely to be entrepreneurs, right, whether small or big, and if this is really affecting her ability to start her enterprise and then maybe move up in her enterprises. So I think that was sort of what we were hoping to see, but we didn't really find uh, much significance coming out from that variable. Okay, so I think the questions that uh, came from Tim, and I'm sorry, I didn't get your name, uh, so Paula, 
All right. I think those are kind of related questions in, in context of our paper, because the first question is about uh, essential over time use, and so child care, which we don't have a measure of, but I mean, the, our dependent variable is productivity, which is value of sales over number of workers in the enterprise. And can you, I really imagine that if you are a woman entrepreneur, spending time looking after your kids, you obviously can't sell as much, you can't be active, involved in market activities as much. So that is, a, in a sense, an observed characteristic in our data because we don't have that in the, in the data set. What you could do, the data set that we have doesn't have that, but there are other surveys in India, the employment survey, which does have information about child care or ex, what we call extra domestic duties, anything like unpaid work, so, uh, or paid work or, 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 or child care. So we can use, match that. I'm not sure how much we can do that on that. It's a very important point. It is not then in this data set, right? On this question of location, I mean, in a sense, the industrial effects capture a little bit of that. If you think about a street vendor, the street vendor has to get out and <laughs> sell his or her stuff, right? So it does capture it, but I think, so within industry, there is a difference. But within industry, if someone can, is working from home, but somebody has to go out to sell, uh, sell the goods, right? Then I can see that might be the case. And clearly, they would be within industry. Difference in whether you work from home or whether you go and work whether you go outside the house, household. And that is the data So actually, I think I'll go and check whether that makes a difference, even if we control of industry fixed effects. So thank you so much for that question. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for these questions. Yeah, absolutely right that, I mean, these are ultra poor women, right? And I mean, you might say going from zero to like something positive, you know. Um, is relatively easy, but that's something that I would debate. Like in the sense that typically in these contexts and what we have about firms is that they make negative profits. So the fact that they even make something um, is still a very positive effect. Like it's still a massive income growth in this context. And I think what we, well, what, what we want to show in, uh, on top of that is to say, this is a population that is very comparable with other pro um, programs or like other papers that have been written where the evidence is um, not even close. Um, so in that sense, like, what, what we want to say is, yes, we can make them into productive entrepreneurs. Um, it is a way of increasing income substantially. Um, but, and this is in line with other papers as well, like from BRAC evaluations, what they find is to say, in this short to medium run, we cannot use entrepreneurship trainings to lift women out of poverty. Like that's, that's basically what this paper says, right? Where we say like they are still living on less than a dollar a day. Um, in the long run, maybe like it's, it's probably gonna be a pro good program to foster private sector development and economic growth in general. And in the long run, they might be lifted out of poverty. But if you would, you know, like, want to say, like, do we make them into productive entrepreneurs to counteract the um, pandemic um, and the impacts of that, then at least, at least this paper would say, not necessarily, because it might take longer to materialize, because this population seems maybe less present biased than we think. They think long term, they become entrepreneurial, and they want to grow, and they even, um, even take it that they're going to have more in food insecurity in the short run. Um, and then basically what you're asking about the reinvestments is an accounting exercise that we have been asked about a lot. The problem is that these are measures that are very, very different, right? Because, I mean, we can ask about total savings and, like, how much did you spend on food yesterday and how much did you reinvest in general. But to make this comparable, I think it's, like, really difficult to go from a measure about saying how much did you make an in income last month to then like divide it up into where this money is going because then you have shocks, you, you need to have this money. But in general, what we, what we find is some of the money that they make go back into the household because like household expenditures do increase by like a bit. It's just not high enough to actually, you know, say like there's a substantial increase in consumption that would make them un like not poor. And like that's basically where we're going with, but like of course some part of it does go back to the household, just not enough to actually make a difference. Okay. So thank you for the questions. I'm gonna answer whatever I wrote here and maybe Javier if you want to compliment something. Uh, regarding the intra household story, 
Uh, we have questions, so we are not asking everything about the partner, but we have a question if they have a partner or not. Uh, and we know if they are working or not as well. We don't know their, we know if they have a higher income as well, I think. Um, so, so that's something that we, that you can control for if you're doing, a, this is just descriptive and these are just tables and tabs. So if you're going to do regressions and things like that, of course you can include all those controls. Um, so that's what we know about house. And for example, in the household, we know if they have kids which are not their children as well. So some of the things you can, you can, you can look if, if the kids are, are or not the children or, and how many other, like, like we have the composition of the, of the household in terms of if they are older people in the household or not and things like that. So we kind of constructed, but it's a phone survey and it was like 30 minutes and we needed to ask as much as we could. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can construct a little bit of the story. Uh, in terms of, of Argentina and informality decreases and things like that, well, as you might know, Argentina has in a very different way informality compared to other countries, right, in, in the household service. Like, there are differences in terms of, like, I remember that we were there and they told us that they cannot ask if they are in, if, if the firm is informal or if you are not paying social security because you will have to tell that they are doing something that it's illegal. Yeah? So in, 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 the, in the way they are getting data, uh, in the way that household services are, are being collecting data is not as in other countries that you could ask, are you paying for pension or are you not paying for pension? Uh, but we can talk about it later and, and you can tell me about this. And yes, we have notes by country. So we have, by, for the first round, we have the notes uh, uh, that we did with the, with the World Bank. And we have a second wave of notes that we also processed for the second round by countries. And you can see a big difference. For example, as I was telling, in, in Argentina, uh, the opening of schools was really... High, well, it was really big, it was a big change between the mid and the end of 2021. And you can see there that the entrance, so the inactive or the ones who didn't have a job are entering a lot into the, in the formal or informal sectors. But employment was like activated by the, clo by the starting up of, of school in in-person school and not a virtual school. So, so you can see all these details that are different country by country and it's, and it's interesting to look at it that way. Uh, and it's also easy to do it because the, the, the data sets are representative by country, so you could just take your own country and go ahead and do any analysis. And we have, like the data is between 1,001 and 1,200 uh, observations per, per, per country, but for example, Mexico has a much higher um, sample size, or Haiti has a big sample size as well. Um, in terms of job loss and gender gaps and the lockdowns and things like that. This is, these are all the questions that we have to exploit and that you can exploit as well with the data. Like what we would want is, this is a project which was really long, involved very, a lot of people, involved lots of money. So I think the best way to, to exploit it is that as many people as possible can use the data. So you just go there and download the data and and you can do as many things as, 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 as you want. I have been doing some kind of correlations. Of, for example, with education, I have been looking at, at, at the numbers. And the thing is that I believe that the countries started like in a block, like politicians needed to take decisions which were very difficult. So a lockdown. So everybody did the lockdown almost at the same time. And everybody opened almost at the same time. So for us, it was like, yes, a week, a month. A, but in the data, you cannot see it as much of, of a difference because, because they were just like uh, started in March and ended in September, some October, some Brazil, for example, had a, a, a smaller lockdown. So you can, you can try to test, but there are like three groups, let's say. So there's not mar much variation in terms of the policies, just to be able to do analysis of differential policies uh, compared to, to the outcomes that, that, that you got. But the data is open to do whatever, <laughs> and like very interesting questions are there. Um, and, and regarding the, the second round of surveys, yes, we have 
done work on, on, on looking at, at the information. And we did check the question about the time use. It's, it's, not a time, it's not that we have, you spent how many hours doing this, but if it increased, decreased, yeah. Uh, and what we see is a slight change in the, in the increase, in the report of, of increase of, of time spent doing household activities. So it increased a little bit for household in general. And it decreased for uh, child care and education and assistance to education. And in the countries that you see the most reduction in assistance to education is when the school in, present, in person is more than 90%. So you see there like a big drop in terms of how much uh, the time spent assisting kids um, um, is taking is taking uh, time from 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 the from the individual that we're uh, analyzing. Um, I think these are all the questions. Javier, do you want to say something? Something else? No? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think we have time for a few more questions. I actually don't have a question, but just to add. A, hi. Uh, all, all of this analytical work is already available online at the UNDP uh, website, in addition to the, to the data, all of the, like the joint work with the World Bank and some of the notes that are no, not joint work. Anyone else? Um, if not, I have a question for Julia. Um, in terms of how you measure food security, and you said it had not really increased, and I think also child, the high school, no, school index, right? Um, and the time between your end line and your baseline was, I think, what, 18 months? Yeah, so I'm, I was curious to see how that was measured, and isn't it a little optimistic to expect that the school index would actually improve? Is, is that not too short a time? Because we don't know what, if they are very ultra poor, what kind of uh, deprivations or what, what, what it means in terms of cognitive development. So uh, I, I, it seemed like you drew too strong a conclusion when you said there's been no improvement. So food security or like insecurity is just a factor of like, have you experienced um, not enough food in like the last um, week, right? Like, or like the last month, I think it is. Um, and it's not about them experiencing more food security, but that they have in experienced more food insecurity. So like the people in the treatment group, um, at midline, so in the time where they make heavy investments, say like, yes, we had more periods where we did not have enough to eat. Um, and then school, the schooling index, I, I, I agree. Like, is this um, not necessarily like improvements in your school and education performance, but like, do you go, like, it's, a, it's, a bun it's an index of a bunch of questions of like how much schooling you get. Um, and I think, combined with like the pandemic it's it's likely not to find anything there um but i but we still find you know like but we're still saying like okay so like we have these high incomes nothing happens with the kids like it's not because it also has measures about like how much you aspire you know to in terms of schooling and things like that and we don't find anything there but i yeah it might be uh, like all of the household and children's outcomes are all in the caveat about saying like maybe it just needs more time to materialize but we say as one and a half to two years is not enough to see anything so like yeah but you're right that is yeah that that that's the statement for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Any Can any I ask last question? Oh, how many months, Miss? Yes. We have a couple more minutes. Okay. One, one quick question. Yeah. First, Adriana, I was just curious about the ownership of cell phones across these countries, right? Because poorest workers probably don't have cell phones. I don't know what the ownership uh, rates are in Latin America, and they are usually in formal sector, and of course, informal sector rates uh, varies across the countries, right? And that will lead to kind of a major problem with representation of the data. So I just wonder whether you've corrected for that, and if there is a difference in ownership rates of cell phones, 
especially among informal workers across these countries. We do have data for that because the problem I have with phone service is that you have to have a cell phone, right? And at least in, in, in South Asia, sub Saharan Africa, that's not the case, that everybody has a cell phone, and usually the poorest don't have cell phones. So I'm just wondering about the representative nature of the data because you're using cell phones and not obviously national representative household service. So. Okay, regarding the cell phones, uh, we have like a list or a census of, of, of all the the random digital dining, what it's doing is that it's using a robot and it's just dialing all the numbers, all the possible numbers, so it's getting the whole thing in, in the country. But what you're saying is if, if, if there's a lack of cell phones in a, in a part of the, of, the, of the country, I know this about Colombia, which is really high, the, the, the number of cell phones, but I don't know for the rest of Latin America, I think it's also high. But the other thing is that we also have landlines. And the other thing is that we have, for example, some countries where they are like, like the initial number is guiding you into a region, yeah? So it's like a zip code, let's say, like a, like a number that it's directing you to a different geographical area. So we also have that, the, the, the sampling is adjusting for, 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 for that information to be like well allocated or distributed uh, between regions. But I don't know the coverage, I think there's no problem in terms of coverage in Latin America, right? Yes. Javier. Yeah, for older than 18 with a cell phone. Yeah, that's that's the restriction that we are imposing initially as well. Yeah. Yeah. But the other thing that we did was check the data uh, against what we know from household surveys, and so that's a reason uh, why we don't have a rural urban analysis for all countries. Whenever like we didn't get the correct numbers. So we did this check because we were we had that concern even though the sampling was done so that it would be representative with no with no problem. Saying that Haiti has a big, big uh, sample size. So so you can correct a little bit for uh, the let's say the number of observations would correct a little bit for the, the mistakes that you have in terms of the sampling. All right. Thank you all very much.